Good morning and welcome to this video um, in my series on Othello by Shakespeare. Now today we're going to be looking at Shakespeare's sources for his play and primarily um, the source text provided by Cynthia. Now you're going to need good knowledge of the plot to be able to follow what we're talking about here. So if you're not sure about the plot of the play, I suggest you pause this video, watch my previous one, the third video in this series about the different characters, and perhaps read up on the plot on the various revision websites that are available freely online. OK, things like Schmoop or Sparknotes or um, Cliff Notes, something like that. Right. As we're watching, then make sure you're taking notes because there's lots of really interesting ideas in today's video. So, first of all, um, Shakespeare's play Othello was based primarily, not completely, but primarily on um, a text written by a writer called Cynthia. And this is, I'm not even going to attempt to say his name, um, this was a writer um, who was known by the pseudonym Cynthia, who was living from 1504 to 1573, and he was an Italian writer. And in one of his texts, I've pictured it here on the screen, uh, Cynthia created 100 linked narratives, organised thematically into groups of 10. And this was um, a very common genre at the time. And there's another writer called Boccaccio, um, who wrote a text called the Decameron, which is structured in a very similar way. Um, and Chaucer, that you might be familiar with in the Canterbury Tales, um, wasn't quite so ordered in terms of creating texts that came together in groups of 10. But he also wrote a series of linked narratives called the Canterbury Tales. And the purpose um, of having linked narratives is that you might have lots of different little stories that are thematically connected together. And those themes kind of build up over time and they look at lots of different examples in order to communicate a moral or a particular idea. You might think in the modern world of a um, TV series like Inside Number Nine, for example, which is absolutely brilliant. It's on BBC iPlayer and it looks at different, completely separate stories, but they've all got a thematic link. Now, there's no particular moral in Inside Number Nine, um, but I do recommend that you go and watch it because it's absolutely brilliant. OK, and uh, Cynthia's text that we're looking at today was published in Italian in 1565. Um, if you have the Arden um, edition of Shakespeare's Othello, then um, Cynthia's text is reproduced at the back of that. And I'm sure it is in other texts as well. So what happens in Cynthia's tale? Well, there's an unnamed Moor who lives in Venice. And he falls in love with and he marries Desdemona. Um, and Desdemona's name in this original tale means unlucky. Desdemona's relatives try to compel her to marry another person, someone a little bit more suitable, um, perhaps due to the Moor's race or due to his um, social um, standing or his economic standing. However, Desdemona and the Moor live in concord and tranquility in Venice. And the Senate then decide to send the Moor, who takes Desdemona and his ensign, to safeguard Cyprus. Sounds a little bit familiar, doesn't it? The ensign is in love with Desdemona and wants to enjoy her, but she ignores him and his passion turns to hate. So he determines that he's going to try to destroy her. Now, I'm sure you're already seeing some key differences between Shakespeare's version of Othello and the version that Cynthia tells. The ensign feeds the moor with stories of Desdemona's infidelity and they kill her together. They beat her with sand-filled socks and then cause the roof to collapse to cover their tracks. Now, those sand-filled socks might sound a little bit strange. Um, the reason why they choose to do that is because they want people to think that it's an accident, not a murder. And so they choose a weapon that's going to leave as little damage on the body as possible. And then by pulling down the roof, if there's any bruises or whatever, then that'll be explained by the collapse of the roof. Desdemona has the opportunity to articulate the moral of the tale. So she says that young women should not marry against their parents' will and not marry a man whom nature separates from them. The implication being that um, people should adhere to the social, the racial, the ethnic boundaries um, that were set in society at that time. Whereas Shakespeare obviously questions those boundaries um, and highlights the racism that's inherent in that ideology. And the Moor is then sent into exile and he's killed by Desdemona's relatives and the ensign is killed by torture. OK, so this is Cynthia's version. Now, as I've said, you'll see quite a few similarities between Cynthia and Shakespeare, but you'll also see some key differences. And it's those differences that really interest me. 
So the difference one, the characters have names in Shakespeare's version. So in Cynthia's morality tale, these characters are types. And in the medieval period, um, there was a, a whole genre of morality tales where you had maybe the villain or the lover or whatever, um, and they conformed to a particular stereotype. What we see with Shakespeare is that he takes some of those types, but actually he presents them as individuals caught up within the boundaries and the interests of society. Mm. So whilst Othello is in lots of ways how uh, the Renaissance audience would have thought a more should be, in lots of other ways, his individuality, the strength of his particular character is really powerful in the play. And similarly, whilst Iago is in lots of ways the stage villain, um, there are lots of things about his character which are really particular to him. And so they're not just types, they're not just um, kind of standard um, kind of jigsaw puzzle pieces that Shakespeare's picked up and reused. He individualises them, he humanises them um, in a much greater way than Cynthia did. And we can also look at the significance of Shakespeare's choice of names as well. So Iago, uh, the name Iago um, is of Spanish origin, which maybe suggests that Iago is an outsider within Venetian society, an outsider who very much wants to be an insider. Um, we could think of the name Othello as well, but we'll, I think we'll do that in the videos I'm going to create on those particular characters individually. Difference two, um, in Cynthia's tale, Desdemona, Desdemona doesn't speak to this scenery. So in Othello, Desdemona is called in during Act 1, Scene 3 to explain her marriage to Othello and she has to speak before all of the senators and her father um, in this very, very male-dominated patriarchal setting and justify what's happened and her speech is crucial to persuading the Duke to allow the marriage to remain and she also convinces him that she's going to go to Cyprus. And once she's defended their love, um, as I've said, she insists she's going to go to Cyprus and Othello really seems less in favour of this idea than he is in Cynthia's tale. Because what happens in Cynthia is that they get married, there's no big confrontation in front of the senators, there's no big kind of assessment of whether the marriage is right or wrong, it's just kind of happened. Um, and then we see Othello and Desdemona talking in their private setting of their home, something that we don't see in Shakespeare's version. Um, and in Cynthia, it's Othello the Moor who wants his wife to come with him to Cyprus because he's worried that he'll miss her. Whereas in Shakespeare's version, Othello isn't really on board with this. He's worried that Desdemona will distract him from the very important job of being in charge of the army. So there's lots of differences there, and particularly in terms of how Shakespeare shapes Desdemona's character and presents her as being a very strong, very determined, very articulate woman at the start of the play. And so you could go into all sorts of discussions there about was Shakespeare a feminist? Can the text be interpreted in a feminist way? Is Shakespeare saying that women should have more power? Or is he saying that the consequence of women trying to get power, trying to articulate themselves, is that they kind of um, put themselves forward for destruction in the same way as Lady Macbeth does in Macbeth? Difference three, the ensign focuses on Desdemona, not on the moor. So in Cynthia's tale, he explains that the ensign fell ardently in love with Desdemona and is prompted to seek revenge when she ignores him. Now, in Shakespeare's version, there's no clear motive for what Iago does. Iago is the ensign, of course. There is a suggestion that Iago fancies Desdemona, but it's not particularly well developed in the play. And Iago mentions lots of different motivations. And uh, the, one of the leading critics um, that people look at in terms of Iago, um, Coleridge says that actually Iago has motiveless malignity. He's got no particular reason for what he does. Whereas for Cynthia, the reason is very clear. Um, the ensign is offended when Desdemona ignores him. And the ensign imagines that Desdemona rejects him because she's in love with the corporal, who in Othello's, uh, Shakespeare's version of Othello, would be Cassio. Now, in Shakespeare's version, Iago is very well aware that Desdemona does not love Cassio, but in Cynthia's version, that's what he kind of imagines in the play. So the ensign becoming Iago, that character is quite different. And one of the main things there is that Shakespeare makes 
um, Iago's motivations much more ambiguous. And this is what we see in the shift from a morality tale to a modern Renaissance tragedy. In a morality tale, everything's very clear cut. You know, it's very clear who's right and who's wrong and what you should do. And there's a clear moral to the story. Whereas for Shakespeare, everything's a little bit more ambiguous and it's not clear why people act in certain ways. And it's not clear how you should react to the play, what you should take away from it, what your moral um, kind of judgment of the character should be. And so what Shakespeare looks at is more the psychology of the characters and why individuals within society act in the way that they do. You know, does Iago um, kind of treat testimony the way he does in Shakespeare's version because of the society that he's been brought up in. He's been brought up to regard women as being kind of playthings. And is that why he sees her as being so disposable in the play? So by changing the ensign into Iago, Shakespeare really opens up a door into all sorts of discussions about the human condition, human character, human psychology, why people make the decisions that they make and what evil really is. You know, we all have a little bit of evil within us, Shakespeare says, and we don't have, you know, one person who's pure evil and one person who's pure victim and one person who's the pure hero. You know, Shakespeare complicates that all for us. A difference for then, there's no Turkish threat in Cynthia's version. So the scenery um, in Cynthia send them more to Cyprus because they just wish to bolster their garrison there. Okay, it's not because there's an immediate threat to the stability of the Republic and its outposts. So this leads us to a really interesting question because in Othello, the Turkish threat actually comes to nothing. So what happens um, in Shakespeare is that the, the senators meet, um, the seniory meets, and they discuss the fact that Turkey is going to invade Cyprus and that they need to send their fleet right away to defend their outpost. Um, so Othello, they all get on the boat immediately and they travel off um, to Cyprus and then they get there and find out that actually nature of the storm um, has destroyed the Turkish fleet for them and that they don't need to do anything. So why? Why does Shakespeare bother changing this detail from the source text? Because it seems like a complete waste of time. It's not necessary to change this. Unless what Shakespeare wants to do is to show how political imperatives, how Othello's job as being the leader of the army has a detrimental impact on his personal relationship. So he wants to enjoy being married to Desdemona. He wants to get used to being married to her. They want to spend time together, but that's prevented because they've got to go straight away and get to Cyprus. So that's the political impinging on personal life. It could be as well that Shakespeare introduces this idea of the storm destroying the ship because he wants to show how powerful nature is in the play. And nature is a really key idea in lots of ways in um, Shakespeare's tragedies. So for example, elsewhere in Othello, we see that nature, your kind of natural instinct to indulge in emotion, in anger, in jealousy, overcomes rational thought. We see that in Act 2, Scene 3, after the fight scene, where Othello comes out of the wedding, um, his wedding chamber and he sees what has happened and he decides that he's going to demote Cassio. And he doesn't do that because that's a logical thing to do. He does that because his emotions are taking over his rational thought and that they are guiding him. And at the end of the play, the same thing happens again. She, um, Othello's emotions um, mean that he ignores kind of rational ideas, logical reasons um, behind Desdemona and Cassio's behaviour. And his emotions guide him to murder Desdemona. So perhaps with introducing this storm, Shakespeare is symbolically showing us that our nature or the nature that's outside of us is actually in control in some ways, or at least he opens the door to, to exploring that idea. Difference five then, the corporal does not get drunk in Cynthia. So I've mentioned already act two, scene three of Othello. And in that, um, they're all on Cyprus, um, the Turkish fleet have been destroyed, they're having a great time, they're going to celebrate. And Iago gets Cassio a little bit more drunk than he should be. And then there's a fight, um, Othello comes out of the bedchamber and demotes Cassio. In Cynthia's version, um, there doesn't seem to be any alcohol involved. And he pulls out his, uh, the corporal pulls out his sword and he wounds another soldier. So why does Shakespeare introduce the idea of alcohol then? Well, again, it's this idea of nature, of emotion, of irrationality 
taking over your rational thought and the idea of losing control of who you are as an individual and Cassio laments this after the fight his drunkenness has caused him to lose that immortal part of himself his drunkenness causes him to lose his identity and who he really is as a person and that is what Iago is doing to Othello he doesn't make Othello drunk um, on alcohol but he changes his perception of the world in a very similar way to the way that alcohol acts on the brain. So this drunken scene is really important within the symbolism of the play. Sorry. The ensign's child, um, he brings a child out to see Desdemona and the child takes the handkerchief without Desdemona knowing. So Amelia's role is occluded there, it's taken away um, in Cynthia's version and Othello introduces Amelia as being the kind of go-between um, between Desdemona and Iago. So we'll talk about Amelia a little bit later in the video but what Othello does is really show her um, subservience to Iago, the fact that she's doing whatever he says um, and he also shows the fact that she's completely unaware of what Iago is going to do with this handkerchief of how um, he's going to use it. Different seven then. The original tale, Cynthia's tale, is much more didactic than Shakespeare's version. So before her death, Desdemona articulates, articulates in Cynthia's version the central moral of the tale. So girls should not disobey their parents, nature or society by choosing to marry the wrong person. Shakespeare's um, play doesn't end with any such moral. There's no clear cut takeaway that the audience will think, right, this is the right thing to do or this is the wrong thing to do. This just doesn't happen for Shakespeare. And Shakespeare is much more com complex in terms of his treatment of the story. And it seems that Shakespeare opens doors into questions. You know, should a girl disobey her parents? Um, what happens if someone transgresses social boundaries and marries someone um, who's of a lesser social status than them? What are the consequences of that? How will society react to that? And so Shakespeare introduces all of these questions and doesn't give any answers. And for me, that's much more interesting. And that's where part of the power and the beauty of Shakespeare lies is that he's not prepared to give us the answers to the questions. He's much more exploratory. Um, and those questions still resonate with us today. So Shakespeare's tragedy is not a didactic play. I think it's important to note to note. Difference eight then, the ensign in Cynthia's version is much more violent. So the ensign attacks the corporal, um, whereas in Othello, um, Iago gets Rodrigo to stab Cassio. And in Cynthia's version, the ensign helps the Moor to kill Desdemona. So there's quite a clear difference there, I suppose, between Iago in the original text and Iago in um, Shakespeare's Othello. And we can understand this because in Othello, in Shakespeare's version, what Shakespeare wants to do is present Iago as kind of taking enjoyment, taking pleasure in getting other people to do things for him. You know, he can do it himself. He does stab Rodrigo at the end on his own without anyone to help. He is a good soldier. He is good in battle. We know all of that. But a key part of Iago's character that Shakespeare wants to emphasise is the fact that Iago likes to get other people to, to do things for them. He enjoys that manipulation. OK, difference nine then. The method of Desdemona's murder. So in Cynthia's tale, Desdemona is beaten and her murderers pull the ceiling down to cover their tracks. So the Moor then admits what he's done on the following day. Um, but in Shakespeare's version, now this scene is incredibly powerful when it's staged. Othello symbolically suffocates his wife in their marriage bed and then he doesn't try to evade discovery. There's no pulling down of the ceiling, anything like that. Um, and in the, my video on Act 5, Scene 2, I look in a lot of detail about the symbolism of this scene. But it's really important to note that um, Shakespeare has made a huge difference here from the original text, and he's done that for a reason. And in your essays, you could explore um, that reason as well. But as I say, watch the video on Act 5, Scene 2, because I talk about it in more detail then. Difference 10, the action returns to Venice. So in Cynthia's tale, at the very end of it, they all troop off back to Venice to have decisions made, to have punishments given out and so on. That doesn't happen um, in Shakespeare's version. After the murder of Desdemona, they all remain on Cyprus. Um, the denouement of the play happens there. Um, and I suppose that's symbolic because if they were to go back to Venice, 
that would be a complete return to order and security and the society that they all understand. Whereas by remaining on Cyprus, they remain in that chaotic space on the edge of civilization, on that boundary space between East and West, between Christianity and Islam, between the sea and the land. Um, and by remaining in that place, Shakespeare suggests actually there's no complete re restoration of order at the end of this play. That chaos still continues. You can't just solve something by going home and going back to that nice, safe society. So again, I, I recommend that you watch um, the video that I've made on the um, settings of Venice and Cyprus to really understand um, why it's so important that Shakespeare keeps his characters on Cyprus at the end of the Difference 11, the ensign and the mower meet different ends in Cynthia's version and in Shakespeare's version. So in Cynthia's version, the mower is sent into exile and he's then sought out by Desdemona's relatives and killed. So he doesn't commit suicide immediately after the murder, which is what happens in Shakespeare's version. And that suicide in Shakespeare is really Othello admitting his guilt and giving himself a punishment for what he has done because he realizes it's a moment of an agorizes a realization of the profound um evil that he has committed and he feels that because he's done this he needs the worst possible punishment and in the christian kind of world view committing suicide at the time anyway was seen as then um sending someone to hell so othello essentially sends himself to hell Similarly, there's a different ending for the ensign as well. Um, in Cynthia, the ensign is tortured and he's killed, and there's a real sense of justice and re resolution there. Whereas in Shakespeare's version, um, Iago's taken off to be tortured, but we never find out what happens to him after that. And so there's a real lack of resolution. So what I'm saying here throughout this whole video is that Shakespeare changes Cynthia's version in order to kind of get rid of the idea of resolution or um, the kind of neatness at the end of the play. And he's posing questions, but not giving us answers to them. Difference 12 then, um, Shakespeare develops and introduces a lot of characters in um, his version of the play. So we have the ensign's wife, who in Shakespeare's version is Amelia. In Cynthia's version, Amelia knew everything but she doesn't speak to Desdemona because she's afraid of her husband. In Shakespeare's version, Amelia doesn't know very much. She knows that Iago is jealous. She knows that he's up to something, but she doesn't know what it is. And so she plays into Iago's hand. She gives him the handkerchief and so on. And she doesn't realize till the end of the play what the reason for that is. Okay, I'm not gonna, not gonna explore that too much. I think we'll look at that in the video on Amelia. Um, we've also got Bianca as well. Um, in Cynthia's version, Bianca does appear, um, but she's only really referred to where she's a much more significant character um, in Shakespeare's version. Rodrigo as well doesn't appear at all in Cynthia's version, but he's introduced as Iago's dupe in Shakespeare's version. Probantio again, you know, the family are vaguely referred to in Cynthia's version, but Shakespeare really fleshes out his character in his own version. I'm not going to talk too much about those four characters because what I'd like you to do now independently is to choose one of those characters, go back to your notes um, from the previous video, look online to find out what Shakespeare does with these characters in his version of the play, and then respond to this question below. So Shakespeare introduced and developed a range of characters who are either missing from Cynthia's text or who play very minor roles. How does the addition or development of one of these characters add to your understanding of the play's themes and concerns? OK, so have a go at that question um, and hopefully we'll see you in the next video where we're going to start to look at Act One.